Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Healing Ties 2.0, featured on the Whole Care Network and UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. I'm your host and presenter, Christopher McClellan. You just might know me as the Bowtie Guy. On Healing Ties 2.0, we visit with people from all over the globe who share their story because it's through story sharing where diversity meets the road to collaborate on a common cause. And our common cause is supporting caregivers before, during, and after caregiving ends. Caregiving is just not a local issue. It's a universal issue that brings people together from diverse backgrounds. And on Healing Ties 2.0, we take the conversation a step farther and ask, beyond caregiving, how do we care? How do you care? How do we care for ourselves, our family, our friends, our community? How do we heal the physical, the social, the financial, the spiritual aspects of our life? We do that by creating healing ties. And our guest today is occupational therapist Amelia Borland. Amelia has spent her entire career advocating for and treating the needs of her clients and caregivers. Amelia has set out to create an organization that provides vital, practical, accessible training for caregivers all over the world through her signature programs at higherstandardcaregivingtraining.com. Amelia's mission is to improve the safety and quality of life for all caregivers and the people they care for. Let's enjoy my conversation with Amelia. Well, greetings, Amelia, and welcome to another episode of Healing Ties. It's a great to visit with you today. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here. I always enjoy talking with you, so I know we're going to have a great conversation today. We've had a, a couple of uh, wonderful conversations already, and to mm-hmm. have you on the podcast, and it's just it's exciting because the work you're doing is just terrific and we're going to get into that but you know i have to ask you right off the bat as i do with all my guests so amelia how are you creating healing ties oh wow that is such a big question and a great question and i'm trying to do that by creating a network of support that links caregivers to high quality professional training to actually give them the kind of hands-on skills that they need. But beyond that, also really fosters a sense of community amongst those caregivers because it can be a very isolating and lonely experience, unfortunately, a lot of the time to let them know that they are not alone in their experience and, and that they do have support and backers. But even beyond that, as an occupational therapist, it's not just my job to teach people how to do things. It's also my job to help people find ways to bring bring meaning um, and quality to their lives through the things that they do. And of course, caregiving is many things beyond just a series of acts that you perform for another person, you know, especially if you're caring for a loved one, they're there are a lot of meaning in those acts. And so it's not just about do this 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 way. It's about how do we help these caregivers and the people that they're caring for maintain meaning in their relationship right. and in their quality of life through through this shared process, because it is a shared process. Very much so. And I think it often we often lose sight that caregiving is emotional. Mm-hmm. And it happens, as my listeners know, I'm prone to say it happens instantaneously because of an unfortunate accident or an untimely diagnosis, and we're thrust into these roles, and oftentimes without a lot of knowledge, but a lot of will to be able to care. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not something that we make a plan to do. We make plans for lots of things in our life. But very rarely do we plan for things to go wrong. And certainly, we don't really make plans to be caregivers, even though the fact is, as you and I have discussed before, 
in the course of our lives, most of us will become caregivers in some way, shape, right. or form at some point in time. But it can be a very scary and shocking and intimidating experience, certainly when you're just sort of thrust into it without any expectation that it's going to happen. Now, as an occupational therapist, I just think this is so fantastic fascinating because I've always been on the other side of occupational therapy. Mm. I've not, and I've, with my partner, I've taken him to occupational therapy. And to talk to somebody who is, well, a professional, <laughs> it's a great honor because it's something that's so important for caregivers and their care partners to experience. Can, so can you talk a little bit about your practice and what you do? Yeah, so I'll give a general overview of occupational therapy to start because it's not necessarily a well understood profession and I'll right. try to keep that brief. Mm -hmm. And then I'll talk a little bit about how I am using occupational therapy to help empower caregivers. So occupational therapy, first of all, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with a job. Occupational therapists define occupation very broadly mm -hmm. as the things that we want to do, need to do and have to do in our lives in order to in order to live meaningful high quality of lives so those can be those can be big things like the jobs that we do for a living but it can also be the things that we do for leisure or for fun all the way down to the most basic of self-care tasks like how we bathe ourselves right. dress ourselves toilet pretty much anything you can think of, even sleep. We even address sleep because we all know how important that is. And oh, if, goodness. I mean, the <laughs> caregiver is almost most of all, right? Because if you are a caregiver, there's a good chance you might not get enough sleep. Yeah, because caregivers nights. know how to sleep with one eye open. Oh, <laughs> right, which is a, a tough way to, to <laughs> operate and exist for a long period of time. But so as an occupational therapist, I've worked with caregivers on an individual level throughout my career walking into hospital rooms, rehabs, people's individual homes, and helping caregivers and, the, of course, the people that they're caring for navigate the situation through, you know, direct rehab services to the person that is being cared for, but also helping to train those caregivers in safer, easier ways that they can help provide assistance or care to the person they're caring for. And in addition really to help the person they're caring for to become active participants in that care. That's something that's very important. However that active participation looks, it can look really different for different people, but mm -hmm. we want to have people be participants as much as possible and, and that can be a great relief for caregivers as well. But I wanted, I have always had a sense that I wanted to be able to reach a, a broader population of people more than just helping one at a time, and that I needed to find a way to do that. And I sort of stumbled upon this idea that actually the education that I provide to caregivers could be distributed in a more efficient way so as to be able to impact a broader number of people. And that also by doing that, I could help create a real community of folks to help connect caregivers and help create, at least for some people, a, a change of, of culture in the way that mm -hmm. we address caregivers and caregiving and giving them the support that they need, the skills they need, the respect that they deserve, etc. So I built, so I built a program basically that allows caregivers to access education and training both on demand and also in live formats. So it's really fun. Actually, uh, I log on with all the caregivers all together in a virtual format. What you and I are doing right now. Right, even, like we're doing right now. Right, we're, where, yeah, right. Where were you 10 years ago when I was in the middle of my caregiving for Richard? I, oh. <laughs> I, needed, that, I needed that virtual program that I can connect to. Oh, well, I wish I had been around then. You know, it, I think about that all the time that like, I wish I would have started this earlier, but it's one of those things that sometimes we all go through our own journey to get right. where we have to be. And, and mm -hmm. it takes a certain level of experience and maturity and just being able to think about how things are done in a different way. And it just took took me a certain amount of time to, to get there. But so that's kind of 
what I do. And I could talk about occupational therapy all day long, but I don't want to. I don't want to bore. I don't want to bore anyone, but it's a fabulous profession and there are OTs out there working OTs out there working for everyone all the time. But that profession is what led you into doing what you're doing today. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we have this idea in occupational therapy of occupational justice, and mm -hmm. that gets down to the idea of trying to help help people who have limited access to occupational opportunities achieve access to those things and that's sort of one of the primary tenets that inspired me to go about helping increasing caregiver access to high quality education and training and community support because there are so many occupations that caregivers fill and, and it's a huge role that they've stepped into and it's so difficult traditionally for them to access the kind of professional right. trained support that they need that I just thought there has to be a better way. And I, I think you're a proponent, I think I know this, but I would not, that you're a proponent that caregivers are really the backbone of the healthcare system. Absolutely. Absolutely. And hopefully this doesn't put any more stress or pressure on any caregivers. They've got broad they shoulders. They have broad shoulders. And they probably know already because they feel that way. Yeah. Ultimately, probably the, the person who has the biggest impact on the health and well-being of the person being cared for is their primary caregiver at home. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the person who's with them. That's the person who knows them best, who notices things, and the skills and ability and knowledge and the respect that we give to that person will define, you know, their ability to effectively care for and advocate for the needs of the person that they're caring for. So, you know, we can see this in really concrete ways. If we give a caregiver the appropriate training on how to prevent things like urinary tract infections. Oh, goodness. How big is oh, that? Oh, that is huge. It's huge. It's huge. And we can prevent a lot of those through education on proper toileting, positioning, management of where the drainage bag on the catheter goes, all that stuff. We can prevent a lot of those things just by arming people with education. With knowledge, because what often happens, and I say this in all kindness, to discharge agents at the hospital is, you know, they're dealing with a, a number of discharges at a time. And it's almost becomes common that, oh, this is what you do, and this is what, and this is where you need to go, and then you're walking out the door with very little skills and knowledge on how to do some of these critical healthcare things that are important for your care partner. Yes, no, the your the listeners cannot see me, but I am nodding emphatically <laughs> this whole yeah. time. No, you're absolutely right. We often forget in healthcare as providers that what our knowledge is not necessarily common knowledge. It's not normal knowledge to have. And we it's so it's so commonplace to us that we sometimes do a bad job of providing education that makes sense to people or of even remembering that they need to be adequately um educated that they need to be empowered with that knowledge as well but there's a lot of pressure on providers it's, you might have 20 discharges you've got to get through that day and so you go through your checklist check we talked about this but it doesn't necessarily provide adequate time for caregivers right. to ask the questions that they want to it's, ask or need it, to ask and that education especially if you have the opportunity to work with a therapist before discharge and that's a pretty big if it, it's a growing if nowadays, as services are stretched thinner and thinner. The training that is being provided is in a hospital room or a rehab facility, and that might not look at all, all like, like what you have to deal with at home. Right. So, and unless those things are addressed, it's really difficult for caregivers to translate that knowledge sometimes to the actual setting where they have to do that care. And you know, the other part of that too is, and this is an unfortunate thing that happens, 
if someone needs 24 hour care or a certain amount of care at home and the healthcare team finds out that there's a family caregiver who can be with that person 24 hours, it's like score. I don't have to pay any attention. I don't have to pay attention it, it, to that. Yeah, that and I don't, and I don't think that's not the intention of the providers. But right. again, it's... when you are so overwhelmed with trying to get through a huge caseload and triage everyone and make sure that everyone gets what they need, when we find out, oh, there's a caretaker at home. They've been doing this already for a couple of months. Great, good. They've got the support they need. Go ahead and discharge. But very rarely do we remember to take the time to really speak with that caregiver, make right. sure they understand what is being asked of them and give them the knowledge to do it well. And are they capable and willing mm -hmm. to do this? Because let, you know, you, you, you triggered a, an acronym that I like to use often uh, when you're talking about caregivers, you know, the CEO, they're the chief everything officer. They do it all, but that doesn't mean we're we know how to do it all properly. We there's one thing to do it out of love and care and commitment. There's mm -hmm. another thing when it comes down to proper uh, procedures and administrating of of meds and of exercises and of toileting. All these things that are foreign that are common knowledge to somebody that's in the medical field. Sure. I mean, it, it seems crazy, but I think sometimes healthcare providers, we just forget like, you know, I got a master's degree in this. How can I expect to impart all the knowledge that well, someone needs in a 15 minute session? I can't. Well, doctors went to four years of medical school plus residency. We're all, we all have these huge educations and backgrounds and experience. And we just have to keep in mind that the caregivers that we're passing these duties on to, duties that in a hospital, unless you are licensed to perform that duty, you right. don't get to lay a hand on someone to do it. And then we send you know, folks home with caregivers who have no training or experience and say, you got it. Well, we just have to provide, and I don't think that's necessarily, it's not a failure of a single person or it, a single profession. No. It's just generally a shortcoming of our system it's a short it is a shortcoming of our system and i think the reasons why you know folks like myself and thousands upon thousands of caregivers who are out there who are so excited to talk to people like you who are making a difference in training and development and bringing awareness to these issues because they're important it helps everybody mm -hmm. it helps people on the medical team it helps the care team when we have more information it does. And it does. And really, it's one of the reasons that I think that that I decided, well, I've got to start thinking outside of the box for how we can solve these problems, because obviously the way that we're doing it now traditionally just doesn't really work adequately for people. So what can I do? How can I use my knowledge? It's one of those things where when you realize that you can do something, you then have the responsibility to do it. And I felt that very strongly in undertaking this project in this program was that, oh, you saw a problem. Oh, you figured out how you could actually help solve it. Now you have to do it. You got to do the thing. You've got to do the thing. Oh, this is just so delightful. So let her, tell us a little bit about your programs that you've created. Yeah, so tell us a little, tell us a lot about the okay. programs. <laughs> okay, well, really, truly, they're pretty simple, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. So, so I have a website, it's at uh, www.higherstandardscaregivertraining.com. And what caregivers can do is they can go there, they can look through the available course selections. Most of my trainings are about very like practical skills. We're talking about how do you perform different types of transfers? What is the equipment that people are commonly seeing and working with and how do they use that safely? What are different what are different care scenarios that people need to be aware of? So for example, I'm working on getting an on-demand course up right now that goes all over things like how do we manage things like supplemental oxygen 
during no. care and transfers. Yes. Like, what do you do if someone has to take a shower and, and, and they have supplemental oxygen. oxygen? And what do you do if someone has an indwelling catheter? How do you manage that bag safely? What do you do if someone has a peg or, or a feeding tube that goes into their abdomen? Abdomen, you know, things like that. So, so it it can get that kind of kind of really advanced education and training all the way down to as simple as this is a wheelchair these are the parts of a wheelchair here's how you use this correctly during a transfer here's how you make transfers easier by using the wheelchair correctly so and i'm always adding content as things come up as i have live trainings with caregivers as as i see more issues just coming up in the world or something will come into my mind oh i gotta have a training for that i'm mm -hmm. always constantly adding trainings and content to the website and those can be purchased just as individual courses they're they're built to be extremely affordable and on demand so they can be purchased as individual courses but for caregivers who are in maybe a more long-term situation, who really find that they need more ongoing support and that they really want to have access to a larger community of support, then I also have a very low cost monthly subscription program, which automatically enrolls people in every single course so they can take what they want whenever they need it on demand. Two in the morning, you need to know what to do with that shower chair, there you go. You just go ahead and take care of it right then. And then in addition to the having access to all the on-demand content, I also do at, at least twice a month live virtual call-in training. So that's a live virtual meeting, kind of Zoom style or Google Meet style, basically. So right. we can mm -hmm. all see each other. We can talk to each other. And it's an opportunity for caregivers to ask questions that they can't find answers to in, in the on-demand trainings or just express things that they need to just kind of be together yeah just to be together and it's a great it's a great problem solving community not only do they have access to me as an expert but of course you have access to the experience of all of the other caregivers that are there as well which could be invaluable i, I am that, prone to say mm -hmm. that the best information and referral usually comes from one caregiver to another because yeah. they've been in the trenches and they would not a caregiver would not give another caregiver a, a bad referral exactly it because they know how high the stakes are exactly very much it's so. very high a and then in addition with that people also get access to just an online chat forum so they can post things questions get answers and again have that kind of community community support so there's really kind of an, an entry level or support level for everyone, depending on what their needs are. There's something for everybody. And it really is, it's as simple as that, honestly, because caregivers don't have time for a bunch of complicated stuff. They don't they have time for, but, and, and that's what we're all trying to do is to give out as much uh, pertinent information as we can, because caregivers don't have the time. Mm -mm. But speaking of time, tell our listeners, what is the day and times of the of those classes, those live classes? So they actually vary. And I, I, vary, I have them on a varied schedule. And the reason is because caregivers don't always have set exact schedules. That, is, that schedules. is brilliant. Well, it, it's just the reality of the situation. If I right. say every Wednesday at 8, I'm going to have a live training, I mean there's a good chunk of people who will never be able to make that. And, mm. and that's not the kind of community that I want to build. I want to build the most inclusive community possible where everyone gets access as much as possible to what they need. So I vary the days, I vary the times. Sometimes it's in the morning, sometimes it's later at night, you know, because people just... It's not like having a nine to five job being a caregiver. It's just not like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's certain. It's kind of like a twenty four seven. It's like a twenty four seven job, mm -hmm. but it's also one of the most. It's the most meaningful task that I've ever done in my entire life. It can be. It's one of those one of those jobs that has a really interesting dichotomy to it. It can be incredibly challenging, mm -hmm. incredibly frustrating, incredibly lonely, but. Right at the same time so so deeply meaningful when we find ways to do it that can bring meaning and care and love and respect for all of the people involved in the caregiving relationship 
There's no greater honor bestowed on us than to be entrusted with the care of another human being. Agreed. Especially at the time when life transitions. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing there's nothing more meaningful but in order to to get there we need folks like yourself who are sharing their expertise and knowledge to help make the journey a little bit better you know i'm always full of stories i the, the my listeners know that i like to share stories especially about richard and i there's one thing that hit home with me you were talking about the shower and one of the uh, this is just a week before he died, but it really hit home with me because we I put him in the shower. And I, I he'd been struggling for a couple of weeks, and then I noticed bed sores. And that's when I re realized this was far beyond my expertise. Mm. And even though we had help coming in, I I I did not know how to handle. I mean, I could read about what you needed to do, and but I I recognized at that point that this was out of my level of expertise. And I think the message there for every caregiver is, and I <laughs> don't mean to be flippant in here. Our caregiving capes are limited. There's things we can do and things that we can't do. Just recognize your limitations and know that asking for help is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of strength. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and this is something that I know I have struggled with personally in my own life. I, I am someone who struggles asking for help. And when I finally learned to say, I don't know, and I need help, it was like the greatest burden was lifted from my shoulders. Mm -hmm. It was a burden, of course, that I had placed there. Right. by thinking that I had to know everything and do everything. And I think so often that burden is one that caregivers have placed on them. I don't know if unwillingly is the right word, but without choice. Well, right. It's It often comes without choice. And some mm -hmm. people are able to take that and run with it. Some people mm -hmm. walk away from it. But oftentimes it's it's not a choice. And oftentimes... Caregivers are taking care of people that they, you know, they have some issues with, whether it's mm -hmm. a parent or a spouse or a sibling. And it's important to learn those skills to put those issues aside if possible and care in the midst of care. But it's not even as gratifying as it is. It's not easy. No, it's not. And as you said, relationships are complicated. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Any relationship is complicated. Throwing the role of caregiver or caregivee into a relationship can significantly increase how complicated a, really, a relationship is or becomes. And I think your point about understanding, for caregivers, understanding the emotional boundaries that they have, the right. mental boundaries that they have, and the physical boundaries that they have knowing what those are and and then helping to find the resources to support within those boundaries if that kind of makes sense makes perfect sense oh good goodness what a delightful conversation amelia we're having this is just wonderful likewise can we do this every day i could i just... think we should i think i i, I want to come to one of your groups i think i we should... oh i would love that i would i love would love that. to do that we could do, okay we, we could certainly do it because this is all about collaboration yeah, absolutely. It's all about sharing information and stories and connecting people. That's what we kind of do best here. So, but uh, <laughs> I think this is probably a good time for us to take our break. And, you know, I got to put you on the spot, Amelia. Uh-oh. You know, I, with all my guests, not only do I ask them how they're creating healing ties, I want to come back from the break and learn one fun fact about you that uh, all of our <laughs> listeners are on the edge of their seats wanting to know about, okay? <laughs> okay, okay, I'll do my best to make it entertaining. Okay, you're listening to Healing Ties 2.0. We'll be right back. Everyone has a story, but not everyone gets the chance to share their story. So we're going to give you that chance. We want to hear about your story. We want to know how you're creating healing ties in your life and in your community. Email 
the bow tie guy at healingties.com and indicate if you'd like to be a guest on the show in order to tell your story to your health, happiness and prosperity. Coming up next week on Healing Ties. You know, we say people who are experiencing dementia experience personality changes and they become really difficult to work with, you know, on combative behaviors. One of the right. symptoms, yeah. But if somebody loses their eyes or if somebody, you know, breaks their hip in a fall and needs to use a wheelchair, we don't say to the person who is in the wheelchair, come on, stand up. You used to walk. I know you can do it. Come on, let's go. You can walk. We don't say to the person who lost eyesight, we don't say, well, look, I'll point you, your eyes, I'll point your head in the right direction and, and you just follow my finger. You can see it. I know you used to do it. And yet when somebody loses rational thinking and they lose the ability to use reasoning, we say to them, oh, come on, mom. Yeah. You need to do this and this. this. It's important because of this. It's important. <laughs> you must not do that because this will happen and that will happen. And, and when we do that, all they can hear is just accusation. <laughs> because there's no reasoning skills. There's no reasoning skills. <laughs> so, so what's wrong with that? We're the ones that are crazy. <laughs> we think they can care. If we just give the reasons, they'll understand. Suddenly reclaim and get reasoning skills again. Hi, I'm Judy Cornish. Join me next week as I talk with Chris on Healing Ties as we talk about the Dawn Method and all things related to dementia and Alzheimer's. Well, welcome back, everyone. We're continuing our just uh, delightful conversation with Amelia Borland. And Amelia, time's up. You're on the spot. You're on the spotlight. You're, we want to know that one fun fact about you that all our listeners are on the edge of their chair. Okay. All right. Well, I, this was hard because I feel like I'm a really boring person actually nowadays, no. but okay, here's a good one. I'm a, a karaoke champion. Now, yes. isn't that fantastic? I mean, I'm a karaoke champion in like, you know, one karaoke bar, but <laughs> that's all you need to be. That's all you need. And my secret is not that I can sing because I cannot. I am a terrible singer. It's all about the performance, Christopher. It's the performance. <laughs> That's right. You, you got to move the hips and shake the shoulders. and Yeah, you need audience involvement. You got to, it, it's got to be a team effort. So tell me some of your favorite songs that you like to, you do in karaoke. Oh, my, my number one is Living on a Prayer by Bon Jovi. Oh, goodness. That is a great song. Oh, it's one of the best karaoke songs of all yeah. time. And it's a real crowd pleaser, which is key in karaoke. Let's see. I love, I can't remember the name of the song right now, but there was this band when I was in college called The Darkness. And it was like a throwback to like 80s hair band rock mm -hmm. oh, what was their song oh okay they have this song called i don't know if this is the actual name because i'm terrible with song names but i believe in a thing called love that is a great karaoke That's jam uh, <laughs> i'm too i'm i've tried to do karaoke but i just can't i just the mind's there but the body just doesn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> there's I was, you know what? There's nothing more liberating than a good round of karaoke. Just like really going for it, even if you're terrible. It's like, it's almost as good for uh, your motivation as running a marathon, which I'm not suggesting to everyone that they should necessarily <laughs> run a marathon. But it's one of those things like you do it and whether you make it through or you fail miserably, you're like, okay, I tried that and I survived. And then you can do anything. I tried it and I survived. <laughs> so I, I, I guess we're just going to have to do a, a, a karaoke caregiver's night. 
Oh my gosh, that's the best idea I've ever heard. That's and we so can good. do it virtually. We don't have to yes. be in the same. But how fun would that be? That would be so fun. Karaoke caregiving. It should be a regular thing that we do. Well, I think we've just created uh, a fun event for us to do. I'm and so excited. And we can include all our listeners. That sounds Karaoke amazing. Karaoke caregiving. Perfect. Oh, now I have another thing to, to think about. And That's uh, just what both of us needed, isn't it? You just need a, one another, more thing another on thing your... to think about. What, but how much fun that would be. I, I can, I'm already picking out people that I could, that can inv invite to this. It's going to be good. It's going to be the, the party of the century. We'll need, a, we'll need a DJ. We will. I don't know any DJs, do you? I've got, I've, I, I have two people in mind right off the top of Perfect. my head. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of them uh, was a recent guest, Christina Best. She won't mind me uh, mentioning her name. She's kind of like you. She's a karaoke. What, what's the the right word? I was going to say king, but that's not appropriate. But but she's very big in the karaoke, and she's got the DJ too. So to me, see, when you share information, what do you learn about people? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, karaoke is one of the things that I have missed during during COVID. I tell you what, not being able to go out and do some. It's high on my list of to-dos once the shenanigans are. Once the shenanigans are over. Yeah, that's the nicest that's way a, to say that's it. That's a code word for COVID-19. So. Uh-huh, yep, yep. <laughs> Goodness. See, and, and all about sharing information, this is a great time for you to share all your information about how our listeners can contact you and find all that terrific information and services that you're providing for caregivers. Yeah, so there are lots of different ways that folks can find me and follow me and contact me. Obviously, they can reach out over the website, and that is www.higherstandardscaregivertraining.com. Folks can also follow me on YouTube. I have a new YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and search Higher Standards Caregiver Training, my channel should pop up. You can follow me on TikTok if you search for TikTok. I know. TikTok. I, I haven't know. ventured into TikTok. Now, there's a karaoke outlet for oh that could be really fun we could do a tiktok caregiver karaoke. challenge karaoke challenge oh. okay so you can find me on tiktok at higher standards caregiver or, sorry higher standards caregiving but you can find me on linkedin at higher standards caregiver training so it's higher dash standards dash caregiver dash training. And of course, you can follow me on Facebook and, and that's at the at symbol higher standards caregiver training. So there's a theme there. There's a common theme there. It's higher standards caregiver training higher standards. <laughs> in all of those platforms. You got it all covered. That's terrific. Yeah, yeah. You know, Amelia, with the great work that you're doing, you're certainly someone who's creating healing ties all around us. I can't thank you for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with all of our listeners today. And I'll, I'm going to be looking forward to that karaoke night. Oh, me too. And thank you so much for having me. It is really, it's such a great privilege. It's always a great privilege to be allowed into such an important part of someone's life, especially when a lot of times if I show up, it's because maybe everything isn't going the way that people are expecting it to. And I, I recognize that. And it's a great privilege to be allowed to be a part of that and to play any sort of role in supporting that at all. So thank you so much for having me here. I'm just so delighted to talk to you as always and so, so very privileged to, to speak to your listeners. It's my pleasure. And I'm sure this isn't our last conversation. I hope not. I know this isn't our last time chatting, Amelia, because I am so impressed with the great work that you are doing for caregivers and the training program that you have put together is just simply fantastic. And I encourage all of our listeners to visit Amelia's website, higherstandardscaregivertraining.com. Amelia offers a variety of individual and family caregiving training programs that will definitely fit your needs. And that does it for this episode of Healing Ties, featured on the Whole Care Network and the UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. And if you'd like to share your story on Healing Ties, email me direct at 
the bow tie guy at healingties.com. We would love to share your story on our network. One final note please subscribe to Healing Ties wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. I'm your host, Christopher McClellan. You might know me as the bow tie guy. I've created a life to love after caregiving ends by being with awesome people like you. We'll see you for another episode of Healing Ties real soon. Bye for now.